Welcome back to the Noel Kassler podcast, episode 60, kicking this one off with an octave mandolin for those listeners paying attention. It's week three of the double course instruments, and I'll tell you the story about that one at the end of the show. It comes from the same twang tour I did with Jackson Brown and the great David Lindley. In the summer of 2010, I was a road manager and I spent my off days buying instruments (laughs) with members of the band. We'd go to music stores and uh, built up quite a collection, you know, on that tour and on on subsequent tours that I did. And they're all here on this property in the barn or in the house. And I'm going to work my way through them. But let's get into life first. Hope everybody had a great weekend. There was some nice weather here on the East Coast. It was Earth Day on Friday, I believe. And uh, You know, Earth Day feels strange at this point in time because, you know, we're not giving the attention we need to give to the environmental calamity that we're facing because we can barely catch our breath from all the fascism that's, that's going around and the fallout from that, you know, the trials and the revelations and, and the, you know, the assaults on democracy that seem to be coming from every direction and that seemed to be unrelenting you know in this past week alone i'm recording this on monday by the way so if you're listening to this i just recorded it i woke up and did a canadian talk show radio show i do once a month called humble and fred up in toronto and then i jumped in with you guys and uh, as i was saying in the last week alone we had ron DeSantis take on disney Okay, the governor of Florida is now going to cost Florida taxpayers in two counties almost two billion dollars in property taxes, a 25 percent increase on their property taxes, which is ironic because people move to Florida to get out of paying taxes for the most part, you know, or live with cheaper taxes. And uh, so he's punishing, you know, primarily Democratic counties by taking on Disney which is just insane, you know, and Ron DeSantis really, really doesn't have any problem with Disney, but he sees it as an opportunity to sort of be the tip of the spear in this new fascism movement and to go beyond what Donald Trump himself had done. And I think that's a big part of this. I think he's trying to show the base that he's a more effective, you know, despot, than, than Donald Trump would be, a man who's completely consumed with himself. And not that to say that Ron isn't consumed with himself, he clearly is, but he doesn't have, he has a discipline that Trump doesn't have. And he has an audacity, frankly, at this point, to just be completely corrupt right out in the open and, and be like, I dare you to do something about it. And to that point, the Florida legislator legislation, the Republicans, They redistrict, you know, they gerrymandered some of the congressional districts in Florida last week based on a map that DeSantis himself drew up. And it effectively eliminates two African-American congressmen, you know, one of which is Val Demings from Congress, right? So the other guy's name is Al something. I, I apologize for not remembering his name, but, you know, he's basically eliminating their congressional seats And they had a vote on it. And the Florida Democrats obviously objected and had a big sort of mass protest objection. And what did the Florida legislator do? Legislation do? They cut the Wi-Fi and they turned off the camera and they did it anyway. That's that's that should send a chill down your spine. Okay, if you're living in that state or any of these other states that are veering in that direction. You know, your representatives are supposed to represent you. It's supposed to be transparent. It, the whole point of democracy is it's representative democracy. You're part of a republic. You get a vote. You know, you have a voice. And when people 
try to steal power and do it behind closed doors because they know it's wrong, but they know essentially nobody's going to stop them because so much of this was on the honor system to begin with. It becomes incredibly scary, you know, and it's doubly scary in a country that, you know, ratified, I think, the 13th Amendment in 1870. Right. So you're giving African-Americans the right to vote in 1870. It doesn't really count because of Jim Crow laws and voter intimidation until 1965, when you have to have the Civil Rights Act. Right. Another basically 100 years later. And now we're what, 55 years or, or and change out from that point, And they're still trying to steal the right to vote away from blacks you know, and not be an African-American like representatives and kick them out of Congress. You know, black folks have, have given more to this country than that this country has given to them. And it's time to honor that and set it right. And instead, things are moving in the opposite direction. And that's horrifying. You know, it's horrifying that people will stand for that. And it's horrifying that so many politicians are on board with it. You know, racism, MAGAism, and fascism has become the coin of the realm for these guys. The guy, David Perdue, had a debate last night in Georgia, and he opened his remarks saying that the election was stolen. It was rigged in Biden's favor because Governor Kemp allowed the radical left Democrats to steal the election. That's insane, you know? And, and it, it also, like, he knows it's not true. You know, he knows it's not true. And David Perdue was a CEO. You know, he was like the CEO of like the dollar store and companies like that. He worked overseas. You know, he's a polished, you know, corporate leader who, who, who 10, 20 years ago would not have spoken this way at all. But he sees it as the only way to power, you know, and he got obviously kicked out as a senator in that last election. So now he's going back at it full fascism. That would have been a front page story. At any other time, probably in my life, if, if a guy running for a governor had said such a thing, it would have been national news because it would have been so out of character with the American experiment in terms of how we discussed it, you know, at least in the public forum. And now it's just another day. It's just another whack job running on the big lie, saying the most outrageous racist thing he can think of. Right. And you can just multiply that to Carrie Lake, to, you know, the lady up in South Dakota, you know, who, who's, you know, used her, her, abused her powers of office to enrich herself. Governor DeSantis, you know, who's, who's everything is a cash grab. He banned all these textbooks that had arithmetic problems that he blamed on CRT, which is a racist dog whistle and not something they're even teaching in schools and something that frankly should be taught. Only if people learn the truth about where they came from can we set this thing right. America needs a moral inventory. <laughs> you know, we need to take stock of our unsaleable goods and be honest about what we have going on here, or else we're never going to progress and truly be profitable in the sense that people get to live lives of enrichment and following their dreams and contributing something, you know, and making the most of their potential. That's how great nations are built not by hiding things in the dark, you know, and appealing to people's base instincts, things that haven't evolved for hundreds of years in the subconscious, you know, of, of mostly white kind of dumbass Americans, for lack of a better term, right, that have been manipulated by corporate interests their entire lives and industrialized, you know, economies that they're just little cogs in but they're handed these little things every once in a while to make them feel empowered, like a pickup truck or a flag, you know, or a set of dog tags and some combat boots. They can go shoot somebody else, even though they don't even know why they're there. Right. But they can pretend like they're a hero for doing it. Come home, get a parade on the 4th of July. It's not to say it's not honorable to serve in a foreign war, but you know, a lot of these people are raised with my country wrong or right. They don't even ask why they're there. Right. So DeSantis is banning textbooks, CRT, you know, in, in math textbooks based on that. And what happens? It turns out that he basically only allowed one brand of textbook that happened to be owned by the Carlisle Group. <laughs> you know, no coincidence there. And if you're not familiar, the Carlisle Group 
is a, a long time right wing sort of corporation that was hand in hand with Bush in the Iraq war and all this kind of stuff. And Cheney, you know, kind of one of those evil empire situations. And that's the only textbook that's now allowed in Florida. So that's a grift, right? That they're going to put money in DeSantis pocket, just like Russian oligarchs did, you know, just like how he banned vaccines, but sold the, the monocolloidal antibodies, right? He had antibody centers set up, you know, the stuff was manufactured by a company up here in Terrytown, New York, in Westchester County. That was a huge contributor to his campaign, right? And all of a sudden, that was the only thing you could get. You couldn't get the free vaccine. You had to go looking for it in Florida. But you could go to the library and get his buddy's very expensive treatment. And we all remember those pictures of people lying on the floor of libraries, like already suffering with COVID, trying to get this treatment. It was insane. And it came and went without many remarks. It was just like, well, that's what Republicans do now. They grift, they steal, they, they stuff their pockets, you know, and they manipulate the masses with these culture war things. And people buy it because they're exploiting mental illness. They're exploiting these fractures within people. You know, if you're showing up in front of Disney World and think Disney is grooming children, you need to go to a psychiatrist's office. You need to get medication. You know, you need treatment. You're seriously mental ill, mentally ill, if that's how you're spending your time. But they're building an army of these people. Trump had a rally in Ohio on Saturday. You know, he had J.D. Vance open for him. A guy who went to Yale, a guy who conned the left with his novel, Hillbilly Elegy, you know, and Ron Howard made a movie out of it on Netflix. And everybody thought this guy was the darling of the left because he was going to explain white rural America to Hollywood liberals. And he was a con artist. You know, he went to, he went to Yale. He's now in Ohio where he's not even from. The dude's from like Kentucky, right? And he's carpet bagging and he's going out of his way to become extremely racist in his rhetoric. And he got Trump's endorsement and he got the endorsement of Don Jr. Who's his opening act. Don Jr. is featuring for this, you know, puffy faced asshole, you know, because they all get the same look, too. It's like they wake up and drink buttermilk to get face fat, you know, because Trump has that. That's why DeSantis is in a baggy suit with a red tie. You don't think DeSantis has a tailor? He went to Yale. Right. He knows he looks like crap, but that's what the people want. Crappy looking guy with face fat who eats French fries. He's just like me. It, but it's a con. They're dressing apart. They want nothing to do with this in reality. Guys like J.D. Vance aren't hanging out in Ohio if they don't have to, right? Melania wasn't with Trump on Saturday night as he had his rally, right? As he grifted more money, as we paid for the Secret Service protection that it requires to go there. And if anybody has any idea how much infrastructure and planning goes into a former president traveling around and doing events. It's immense. And that's why most of them generally lie low. I was Clinton's escort on many events in New York City. One or two agents come through Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center first. They do a walkthrough. They make contact with me. He comes, gets in and out of the building, very stealth. Jimmy Carter was the same thing. You know, when we did the 9-11 memorials, we had all five former presidents at one point there when we did the opening of the museum. Very stealth, but a lot of operational kind of logistical securities involved for good reason, right? But Trump is exploiting that. He's just picking a rally every weekend in North Carolina and Ohio, and then we have to foot the bill. We have to send guys out there days in advance doing site searches, you know, doing bomb sniffing dogs, doing all the crazy logistical stuff it takes to, you know, move a former president around, you know, it's disgusting. And he knows he's grifting people. He's not, you know, registering and declaring his candidacy with the FEC because he wants to spend that money any way he can. So he's over, he's doing these rallies. He's selling merch, you know, I'm sure he, I'm surprised he doesn't say, Hey, I'll be at the table signing afterwards. Come get a t-shirt. <laughs> you know, it's a cash grab and we're paying for it. And he's basically sticking his middle finger up. 
you know jimmy carter lives in a house in georgia the house costs less than the suv that the secret service who have to sit outside all night in costs right the secret service are in this special suv that costs you know a few hundred thousand dollars it's bulletproof it has all this kind of technological stuff to protect the president it sits outside of this modest home that Jimmy Carter lives in with Rosalind Carter. And then he spends the rest of his time building houses for the poor and teaching Sunday school. If you ever wanna meet a man of God, get close to that guy. He's living the way it should be lived. You know, I talked about my grandma last week on the show and I got a lot of nice feedback, I appreciate it. My grandma, when she retired, you know, she worked in finance, she had a lot of different jobs. At one point she was Ram Dass's secretary when he was Richard Alpert at Harvard. My grandma was his secretary, <laughs> okay? And it just went on from there. But uh, in the eighties, she worked for a big finance guy in Wall Street, you know, boom in eighties kind of thing. And she decided by the late eighties in Peekskill, New York, in, and in Westchester County, there was a homeless problem. You know, a lot of homeless people were getting on trains in Grand Central and coming up, you know, and getting off in like Peekskill and stuff, which is kind of an urban town in Northern Westchester on the Hudson River. And they had nowhere to go and they needed to be taken care of. And my grandma said, let's set up a shelter so we can take care of these guys. And she was fought on it by the county executive who at that time was a guy named George Pataki who later became the governor of New York. But at that time, Pataki Farms is from Peekskill. He was a local sort of powerful, wealthy man and he fought her because he didn't want to bring down the brand and admit that there was poverty and homelessness in Westchester, which is, for those listeners that don't know, it's kind of an affluent suburb of New York City. It's like the leafy suburbs, you know, Scarsdale, New York, and Bedford. It's where the Clintons live now. And uh, it's where I live. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not some elitist kind of guy, but it's, it's a nice place. And they, you know, a Republican didn't want to admit there was a problem, let alone help people, right? Because that's not the brand. And my grandma basically said F you and got Catholic charities to back it and bought an old warehouse down by the river and set up a homeless shelter, you know, and ran it for years and then handed it over to people who continued to run it. That's what she did with her time. I'm not saying this like my grandma's a saint, you know, it was just like she saw a problem and she tried to make it better. That's what we're supposed to do, especially people that have gotten some rewards out of this life. You know, it used to be the Kennedys. It was like, you know, ask not what you can do for yourself, but what you can do for your country. You know, those that have been given a lot, owe a little bit more back. That used to be an ethos. You know, that was old school right and left. You know, I, I know I go after the Republicans, but, you know, there was modesty in the conservative movement for a long time, too. Greenwich, Connecticut, you know, in the 50s and 60s, even into the 70s, it was all about like how modest your wristwatch was. CEOs of companies would outdo each other to wear like Timexes and, you know, lower end watches because they didn't want to be these flashy CEOs and flaunting it. And then it all changed in the 80s. This greed is good thing took hold. And then everybody put, started putting fences around their houses, you know, and these big walls living behind walls, you know, driving Maybachs, wearing $300,000 watches when your employees are working for 30 grand a year. You know, it's insane and, it, and it's unfettered greed. And it can only be stopped with some, with a sort of sense of morality and purpose, which will give you more in life than just taking care of yourself and spending money. Right. It's Monday morning. The first headline I saw today was that Twitter approves Elon Musk's offer of fifty four dollars a share, which is forty three billion dollars for Twitter. So that may play out that by the end of this day, by the end of Monday, Twitter may be owned by Elon Musk, the guy who's the richest man in the world. Right. Imagine waking up on Monday morning, knowing you could solve any problem on this planet right? And still be the richest guy in the world. You could wake up with $43 billion and be like, I'm going to, I'm going to solve childhood poverty. I'm going to take care of every kid in a foster home right now and make sure they're guaranteed to have a college education. I'm going to wipe out student debt. You could do all of that by 930 
smoke a joint, spend the rest of the day watching porn and still be the most successful human being on the planet, both in terms of wealth and what you just contributed, <laughs> right? Who wouldn't take that? But instead, no, I want to control everything. I want to have more wealth. I want to feed my own ego and narcissism. And that's rewarded. The guy has an army of worshipers who think that's the coolest thing in the world. You know, I get it when you're 15 years old thinking owning a rocket and stuff would be really cool. But when you're 50, you know, and maybe you have gotten some rewards out of life, but you know, somebody else is sleeping on the sidewalk. It doesn't feel good. If you're really honest with yourself, if you're really checking in with your soul, it doesn't feel right. It's like Earth Day, right? You know, we're in peril, not just from climate change, from pollution. I mean, look at this war. Every day you turn on, you see another big oil plant that got blown up in Ukraine and now Russia, where they're getting sabotaged every day, you know, which is good because you want to stick it to the Russians. But every time you see that black smoke going into the atmosphere, it's making us all a little sicker. You know, it's killing this planet. It's poisoning this stuff. Animals look like, look at us like we're crazy. You know, think of the dogs in Ukraine. You see these pictures of people taking care of their pets. I saw a lady the other day, old, older lady, you know, 80, you know, she was probably 40, but <laughs> like Ukraine years now, you know, will age you and they're beautiful people. I'm not, you know. You get my point, but this old lady is standing outside of her home with her dog and the dog got so freaked out by the constant gunfire that she did all she could do to keep him, you know, comfortable. And she wrapped like a shawl around the dog's ears and stuff, you know, so he couldn't hear all the bombs and explosions or at least muffle it a little bit. That's insane. You know, that somebody has to do that. And I looked into the dog's eyes. You could see it in his picture. You know, dogs are like reflections of our soul. You know, and animals always seem to look at you with empathy. My cat was my best friend for 17 years. And he would always look at me in my darkest moments like, what are you doing, Noel? You know, when I was dr drinking to the point of, you know, going to kill myself by drinking, you know, just drinking so much late stage, you know, alcoholism. My cat would look at me like, dude, what's going on? And it's finally, that's what got through to me. You know, seeing truth and love and beauty reflected back at you through nature should remind you of what you are and where you come from and what the potential is. And I feel like these animals are like, what are you guys doing? You know, it's springtime here. We get to eat today. We get to run around. We could be playing catch right now in a field. Instead, you're burying bodies in it. Why? Because some madman on the other side of the border says we shouldn't exist because he wants to exist more. And the rest of the industrialized world prop this dude up for 20 years and put him in the G8, you know, and let him come to world conferences and let him pull strings in this country, in the United States, let him back a candidate who was a reality show clown who had 40 years of lawsuits, 4,000 of which he was involved in because of nefarious business activities before he ran for president, whose children were known grifters, you know, who ran fake cancer charities and bullshitted people about condo developments that were never going to be built, but took all their money, that sat around getting drunk and snorting coke, pretending like their father made them little princes right? That's, that's what we're allowing this to happen. You know, it's so plain what's going on in the world, you know, and, and we all bear some responsibility, right? We, we've all participated in this system. You know, everybody gets mad, like, oh, you know, take an example of, of the guy, you know, Mark Burnett, he, he created Trump's image based on Putin and his oligarch saying, you want to do a show on this guy, Trump. This is our guy in New York. Do a show on him. Mark Burnett does that show, rehabs the image of Donald Trump, gets everybody in middle, middle America to think this guy's a billionaire, savvy genius, throws some celebrities on there to make it titillating. Everybody's in love with reality shows now anyway, you know, at the time, because it's like gossipy. 
right? It appeals to your worst instincts. That's why people watch it, right? It's like watching a fight in a high school hallway or something. You know it's wrong, but you can't look away. So they create this guy. He cons half the country. And then they say, hey, let's have this guy run for president. And the Russians get knee deep into manipulating people. These same people I talked about at the top of the show, these people suffering from mental illness that are showing up at Trump rallies and saying Jackie O is still alive and Princess Diana is still alive, which they said this weekend. You know, these are people who need help, but they're manipulating them. But people get mad at a Mark Burnett. He created this thing, but then they watch The Voice. You know, they watch The Amazing Race. They watch Survivor. They watch all these other products that are being sold by the same guy and the same corporation. And then they wonder how we got here when it's too late. You know, the, the war in Ukraine is the same thing. How did we get here? What? How did we get here? Putin was a maniac. He did this in Syria, right? He did this in Chechnya and Grozny. He's been doing this shit for 20 years. He told us who he was, you know? He's a deeply, like, wounded, psychopathic asshole. Remember when we had the Olympics in Russia? Putin went and had all the dogs killed in the town because they had stray dogs and he thought it would look bad on camera. So he had squads going around murdering dogs, right? And we went anyway and did an Olympics there and sent Matt Lauer there to rape interns, you know, while they're broadcasting the Today Show from Sochi, you know, and we made little figurines and we put it on TV and we watched the opening and closing ceremonies in the country of a despot, you know, of a brutal authoritarian leader, the worst guy since Hitler on this planet. And we reward people because there's money to be made, you know, and, and that's what it all comes down to. How well is a buck to be made? Can't be that bad. You know, it's like we all participate in things that dilute our own souls, you know, and, and it's hard to pull away. It's, it's hard to not you know, spend your money in the convenient ways that it's, you know, that consumerism is offering you. It's hard not to order on Amazon when you could just click once and something's going to be delivered at your door. But do you really need a truck, another truck to come deliver that thing when, when somebody else already delivered it probably to a store down the street from you and a store is employing people, you know, and helping them get by in their older age. I go into CVS now, it's older people because you know social security is not enough, right? So they got to go work at CVS when they're 80. So go at least help them, right? You don't have to just click everything and have it delivered to your door. And by the way, social security will be gone if these Republicans come back into power. That's the first thing on the chopping block. You know, Rick Scott, another guy from Florida, the dude who pleaded the fifth 500 times in his deposition and walked away with millions of dollars after the largest Medicare embezzlement scheme in history wants to do away with social security and basically make people who pay less than hundred, make less than hundred grand a year, pay most of the taxes. So he can give another tax break to the Uber wealthy. You know, that's why all these rich guys are running for office. Dr. Oz, that guy's a scumbag. His, his stage managers hated him, <laughs> okay? He's, he's a dual citizen. He's in bed with Erdogan. His sister-in-law works for Erdogan. The guy is a fascist who makes tens of millions of dollars a year. It's probably between him and his wife worth well over $100 million. As I said, his wife owns that Esplenda company, the big tree service company, Mehmet's rich. His whole campaign is just standing in front of a, you know, a gas station complaining about the gas prices and his chauffeured SUV. Like, are you kidding me? And people are going to fall for that. Hopefully they won't. But what you need to ask yourself is why is a rich guy like that trying to get a, a job that pays, you know, 200 grand a year that you have to work all the time at? What is his interest in that? You know, it's because he wants to get even wealthier and he wants to help his friends get really wealthy. Same reason Jared Kushner was down there in the White House cutting deals with Saudi Arabia. You know, so they want to cash in on this. And the way to cash in is to keep manipulating people, to keep, you know, engendering hate 
and rage. Marjorie Taylor Greene was on trial Friday. I'm sure some of you guys saw it. You know, I was live tweeting it the whole day and it, you know, it was insane, you know, and, and she felt like she was winning and she probably was because the judge seemed to be on her side. <laughs> you know, it was just like the case of that teenage murderer kid. You know, the judge was all but like, where are you from, boy, to the prosecuting attorney. It was like, this ain't New York City anymore. You down in the South now, boy. Next question. He was protecting her. And, 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 and MDG, MTG, whatever the hell her name is, meth badger, was smiling through the whole thing and saying, I don't know where you're from, and getting in her QAnon talking points. And her, it was BLM and Antifa that we were fearing on January 6th. No, it wasn't, right? We all know who attacked on January 6th, and everybody seems to know that now that Trump was at the center of that, and they have documentation. Yet another Mark Meadows scandal broke this week. You know, Mark Meadows should be in jail. MTG should probably be in jail because I feel like she was the pipe bomber, you know? And how did they not figure out who that is? It's been a year and a half practically, right? Where's the FBI? You know, how, how are these people still out here fundraising? How are they still sitting on trial and, and you could see the contempt that mtg had for even being questioned on this stuff because she's sort of a post-trump post QAnon candidate she's never really seen a republican held accountable before so it was shocking to her that she even had to testify you know and she had her boyfriend matt gates there for moral support and one of trump's lawyers hopped up at one point when they asked about her and trump having a discussion about declaring martial law the day before January 6th, right? When we already know MTG visited the White House, came outside and made a video, said we're planning big things for the next day, right? So the, the January 6th committee has testimony that, you know, that, that martial law was discussed. And when the prosecuting attorney asked MTG about the discussions with the president invoking martial law, a lawyer we hadn't heard from hops up and goes, I object, I'm, I'm President Trump's attorney, ex-president, he should have said, but he said President Trump, which was another thing they slipped in there, right? I object. And the objection was sustained, right? So what's going on, you know? How is this allowed? How are we still dealing with this at this point? And you're running against the clock, as I say every week. You know, hearings on January 6th commission in June, a report coming out in the fall, and then an election in November. And we still haven't found an effective way to shout down the lies. And meanwhile, they're having rallies, right? And they're building war chests and they're building support and they're metastasizing, as I talked about in the car rant this week, you know, you got Purdue. You got Carrie Lake, you have governors, you have senators, you have redistricting things like what I said happened in Florida, where you're cutting Democrats out of the process. You know, there's not going to be a fair vote in Ohio for like another 10 or 20 years because of their gerrymandering. That's why your Jim Jordans can go along with insurrections because they know they're going to get away with it. And by the way, in some of the recent testimony, a White House official testified you know, both as to Mark Meadows' knowledge of this stuff, but that Getz, MTG, and Jim Jordan were deeply involved in the planning, right, of January 6th. But only Jim Jordan got the Presidential Medal of Freedom afterwards, right, on the Monday after, which makes you think, what did Jim Jordan do that those other two didn't, you know, especially if MTG planted the bombs, <laughs> you know? And we all saw Matt Gates test, you know, texting that morning with a smirk on his face on the floor, you know, of the house as the Capitol was being attacked. How come they didn't get presidential citations, but Jim Jordan got the Presidential Medal of Freedom on the Monday right afterwards? Like, who would have been thinking about that on the Monday after all that went down? Right? Trump was buying his silence. You know, I think Matt's pro or Jordan's probably the guy who got rid of the burner phones or something. But how did that go down? You know, 
How did all this craziness happen? Steve Bannon gets a pardon. Still a player on the scene. His trial isn't till July. His co-conspirators, when they grifted a bunch of people to, for building the wall, and they said, send donations for building the wall, and then they kept it for themselves, like tens of millions of dollars. His two co-conspirators were just sentenced this week. Bannon couldn't be sentenced because he had a presidential pardon in his back pocket already. That's crazy. He got away with something that his two buddies who did the same damn thing are going to jail for. Right? It, it's a criminal conspiracy. It's plain as day. And as to this point, we've had no accountability. And people's tensions and emotions get high when that stuff happens. And what we tend to do on the left is fight with each other. You know, we become so exhausted and so exasperated that it's easier to go after, you know, somebody else who's basically on your side but says something you don't like than it is to to face what we're facing, but you can't lose focus. We have to get more focused. You know, we have to get crystal clear on the messaging, you know, and we have to sort of like tune out the grifting, but like who's doing this for the right reasons and what do we need to say about what's going on before it's too late? Because it's not just the immediate stuff we're dealing with. We're gonna be dealing with the next generation. There's children being raised in these homes right now. You know, there's kids being dragged to these MAGA rallies. A lot of them will reject it, but many of them will be indoctrinated into this stuff. And the second generation is always stronger than the first, right? Think of the weed you got now compared to, you know, what we had when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, it's like nuclear, right? Racism does the same thing. You know, there's, there's things that are, set out in the open now that never would have been said in public. So what does this next generation look like? You know, what are these fascist, you know, lemmings going to do when they get to college, when they get out of college, when they start running for office, when they learn from the successes and failures, you know, of the MAGA movement that came before them. So we better be rising to that occasion and sort of training just as hard because you have to convert these people. You have to bring them back to the truth. And, and, and the, the most profound well of truth is nature. Okay, You can learn more from nature than you can from the written word, in my opinion. You know, Just by observing and being present, you can learn a lot. Sit around a pond all day if you ever get that luxury and watch birds, you know, as Thoreau said. You know, take an insect that you see and like let it land on you and look in his eyes if you can. You know, watch the harmony that nature exists. You know, you ever see an ant get stepped on, the other ants run over and they pick them up, bring them back to wherever. Like I watch ants all day long and I walk around <laughs> on my deck and try not to step on ants. It's like bad day if I end up hurting something, you know, but uh, you watch them. It's a society right? None of this stuff is random chaos. Everything has a purpose. And when you watch how other creatures live in harmony with each other and how nature can work in harmony with each other, you can learn something profound about yourself and your own nature. And sometimes you come to the realization that you're a part of that, you know, and that's real power. That's real strength. That's awareness. And that gives you access to presence and a deep reservoir of love from which you can actually change things because then ideas start to come to you that come from a deeper place, you know, beyond your own mind and your worries and desires. And if you're like me, you live in a lot of self-centered fear, you know, I'm not some deeply spiritual person. I'm just another dude like worried about his own shit all the time, right? But that doesn't get me anywhere. But sometimes when I get centered and I'm present, I realize, hey, I'm only here for a little bit of time. Most of the stuff that I think really matters doesn't matter. You know, and the stuff that matters, why waste a moment of this precious life not doing it, not being part of love, not trying to give love and kindness in all my interactions, you know, and back to myself. 
And the easiest way for me to always connect to that is nature because it's always there. It's always, you know, it's always a beautiful day, even when it's rainy, you know, there's something to learn. There's something to see. And ultimately that's all it is. You know, this is one big organism. We're all connected and we're destroying it, you know, and earth day is now thought of as like, you know, that's something for the environmental people or the left as if the right doesn't live on the same planet, you know, earth day should just encompass the, the human beings, you know, the flowers and the animals and the people, you know, the, like earth should be you, like you are the earth. We're not separate. If there's one thing you can learn, it's like we're all made out of the same material, but you don't really get to learn that in this realm. And it gets too esoteric, you know, to even talk about it in context like this, you know, and I promise I didn't take acid <laughs> today. I'm stone cold sober, you know, but you know, when I was a kid and I took acid, that's one of the revelations you have, right? You see the patterns in everything. You see the floor undulating, you see the trees and the bark and the leaves and how it's all connected. That's a profound insight. You know, that's not just something that exists to go see a fish concert or a dead show, you know, that's peyote. That's, you know, Toltec wisdom, right? There's a lot of wisdom in the native cultures of this planet, which is another, you know, crime that the sort of white European male perpetrated on us is that, you know, when we came to this country, we committed genocide on Native Americans. You know, you, you can't think of a people that lived in better harmony and concert with nature and, and how much knowledge we lost by not embracing and learning from a culture, you know, by dominating it and eradicating it out of fear and, and, a, and a quest for simple powers. You know, any power you get with gunpowder isn't real power. It's an illusion. It's an act of violence. And ultimately, it's a betrayal of yourself and your own soul. Native Americans knew this. They see the value in every animal. They worshipped every animal because it gave them life. Right? The same life that they inhabit. That's where we're all at. You know, and that's the kind of thing I think about on Earth Day. And then I think about this summer when I'm going to be doing some shows. Nice segue there, right? I'm going to be at City Winery in New York City on June 7th. I'm going to be in Philadelphia June 8th, another fantastic city. I'm going to be in Cape Cod on August 3rd at the Music Room. And I know you probably listen to my podcast and you're like, how the hell does this guy do stand up comedy? But I promise you it's funny. And I promise you, I'll tell you some stories on the road. You know, I like to share the things in my life that had a big impact on me that changed me, you know, from having my eyes opened. And a lot of that came from just, you know, doing gigs and traveling and hearing from these guys, you know, music is harmony. You know, comedy can raise your spirits. It's not just about laughing and poking fun at somebody. If you get in a room with other people and you laugh, you're sharing energy, you know? And, and I like to talk about subjects that matter to me because the world's on fire, right? So I want to point towards the truth if I can. And I want to share things that are true for me. And when I feel it in my heart, I know it's the right thing to be talking about, you know? So come on out and see me. It's a good time. You know, that's all I sell tickets because the club has to get paid and T-shirts, I guess, on my website, noelcastler.com. But enough, you know, branding and commercialization. I just wanted to mention that I'll get going here in a minute. We all got busy weeks to get into. I mentioned this guitar, you know, this octave mandolin at the top of the show. I got that in Maple Street Guitars in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, we were there on a day off before a show at Chastain Park with Jackson Brown and his band. And I was in a store with Mark Goldenberg, who's a wonderful guitar player. I mentioned him in last week's show. And uh, I started picking it up and playing it. Mark comes up to me and goes, hey, Noel, think of how many girls you'll meet in Central Park playing that thing. <laughs> 
sold right and uh i don't think i ever met any girls with it but i definitely played it a lot in central park and i played it on the show with you today it's a beautiful instrument it's been in my collection needs new strings as many of my instruments do the thing with the double chorus instruments is they're a real pain in the ass to change the string I'll, maybe I'll play a 12 string next week, which is like my least favorite instrument <laughs> to not to play. I love the harmony that, you know, sympathetic harmony you get from strumming them. But God damn, changing the strings is a pain in the ass for any budding guitar tech collectors out there. The more instruments you own, the more instruments you have to take care of, which you don't think about when you're accumulating them. But they all remind me of something. It's just like my comedy, right? It's stories. It's things that are meaningful that I've used to be in the moment and sort of raise the vibrations around me, you know, even if it's just to make myself feel better, you know, it's good for us all to find a way to let off steam and to be creative and, and just be creative in just for doing it. It doesn't have to turn into a career. It doesn't have to be better than anybody else's. Just make some noise, make some color, express yourself, let it out, you know, don't hold on to things you feel because it becomes clutter and emotional clutter can block you off from the source. You know, we all are going through trauma. Don't think you're escaping it. I doubt anybody who listens to this show thinks they are, but you know, nobody rides for free, you know, as my old mentor Jackson would say, right? So we're all paying like double fare these days, you know, and we're not you know, going through the hell and horrors that they are in Ukraine, right? But you're seeing it, you know? I saw this beautiful young woman who got killed on, on Easter. Easter for them was yesterday, right? It's an Orthodox calendar or something. It's different. But, you know, her building got bombed, right? This beautiful young mother and her baby were taken from this planet. You know, you look at that picture and it breaks your heart. It's trauma. And that's being multiplied thousands, tens of thousands of time over, times over, you know, in a country where we're still reeling from a million deaths in COVID. And last week they lifted the mask mandates and people clapped. What are you clapping for? Somebody's relative dying alone in a hospital hallway? Nurses working 23 hour shifts that'll never probably be the same, right? What are you clapping for? You didn't win a war. It's not over. People just conceded, right? Because the lies became too loud to ignore and people relent. That's what the right does. They're bullies. They keep bullying and hammering at away at things till you don't know what's reality anymore. And it's effective. And that's why they're all piling on. That's why you have the Purdue's and everybody, the JD Vance's, all these guys are running on the same strategy. Their, their voters are too stupid to find out the truth, and they like this loud, you know, grievance-oriented rhetoric. And once I get into power, nobody can touch me, and I'll make a gazillion dollars. That's no way to run a democracy, folks, and I think you know that, okay? But thank you for listening once again. I promise we'll get back to lighter days. Come and see me live. We're going to have fun. If you listen to the podcast, tell me about it. You got any suggestions or comments, reach out to me. Everybody be well. Take care of yourselves. I love you. I thank you so much for listening. You know, I know I'm an irascible sort online, <laughs> but uh, I do appreciate you guys. You make my life better. And uh, it's an honor to talk to you every week. And thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. Episode 60 of the Noel Kassler podcast is done. Peace. <laughs>